Hi everyone, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us at Journey Church. We hope that you'll find us to be a meaningful time for you. And I'm particularly delighted that we have with us today, Dan Booth. Hey everyone. Dan is here with us and he's gonna be sharing some with us about his faith journey. And so Dan, I wanna ask you, how has your faith influenced the way that you handle money? Hmm. Well, both Ann and I were brought up in the church. So at an early age, we were taught that we should be uh, not to worship money, not to be greedy, but to be generous with what we've had. Now, having said that, we also believe that God created everything and gives us everything, which includes money. Years ago, when we got married, Ann and I decided that it would be our goal to give to the church faithfully and to other charitable organizations. Now, we decided to give uh, one-tenth of what we had. So, uh, we have been blessed, and we have we focused mainly on our needs, and uh, it didn't come easy giving 10% to start with. There had to be some work as far as debt being paid off and some planning, uh, but now we do give uh, faithfully to the church and other charitable organizations. And not only do we give one-tenth of our income it comes in, if anything extra comes in like inheritance, uh, stimulus money, or uh, let's just say tax refund checks, uh, we give accordingly on that also. So I'm curious, Dan, if you'd share with us, when it comes to managing the money that you said belongs to God yes. in godly ways, What's been the hardest thing to do to make that a reality? The hardest thing to make that reality, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is to get rid of debt, unnecessary debt, particularly credit card debt. You have chosen to be faithful in giving to God and to try to be generous in your giving. And there are other people, Dan, who have wanted to do that, may have tried to do that, but they struggle in actually being generous. What advice would you give to those folks? Well, I pretty much really covered it. You've got to eliminate your debt to the best of your ability. There's going to be some debt that you're always going to have. Uh, the mortgage is one of them. Uh, rent is one of them. It's very hard. Most people do not have the ability to go out and buy a new car and pay it off you know, when they buy it. The biggest thing that you can do is Hmm. Don't let your wants exceed your means. Focus on your needs. And, and people say, well, what, well my need is a, a brand new car. Well, no, your needs is, is three things. And that is food, shelter, and clothing. If we have those things, then we can get by. The rest of it is just an additional gift from God. And we've been extremely blessed in our lives. Our needs have already always been paid for. Uh, God has always provided, uh, and we as a couple are satisfied with what we've got. I'm appreciative that you're willing today to share some about your faith journey and how that's impacted your giving. Thanks so much, Dan. You're quite welcome. We're glad to do it. Hey, everyone. We're in a series called The Truth About Money. I think this series is so very important to help people and at Journey, we want to help people. The current situation in the U.S. indicates that a lot of people need help when it comes to money. 68% or about two-thirds of U.S. adults are at least somewhat concerned about their personal financial situation, with 34% or about one-third extremely or very concerned. Almost 40 million households have no retirement savings at all. Of those households who took out student loans, on average, they're over $50,000 in debt for it. So many people struggle with their yearnings exceeding their earnings, and it results in their ending up in big-time financial doo-doo. So many people are stressed out when it comes to money because they continually want more, more, more. But the wisdom of Scripture says, 
it is better to be happy with what you have than to always want more and more. Always wanting more and more is useless. It is like trying to catch the wind. So, what are some consequences of continually wanting more, more, more? Wanting more, more, more can lead to more anxiety. Workers may or may not have enough to eat, but at least they can get a good night's sleep. The rich, however, have so much that they stay awake worrying. How does anxiety about money affect people? How does worrying about finances impact people's health? It's been found that it may lead to insomnia, but also to gastrointestinal problems, high blood pressure, heart disease, substance abuse. Wanting more, more, more can lead to more exhaustion. Proverbs 23, 4 says, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to control yourself. So many people feel so, so tired because they continually are expending so much energy trying to get more and more. Leo Tolstoy tells the story of a peasant whose master said, I will give you as much land for you to keep as you can walk around in one day. Instead of walking, the peasant started running. He ran and ran, trying to get as much land for himself as possible. But at the end of the day, he died of exhaustion. Many people give up their health in the first half of life in order to get money, and in the second half of life, they give up their money to try and get their health back. Wanting more, more, more can lead to more conflict. How many homes are filled with conflict over money matters? Scripture just lays it right out there. Being greedy causes trouble for your family. The truth is, being greedy, wanting more and more and more, results in so much relational conflict. 1 Timothy 6.9 says, Lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. In fact, one of the primary causes of divorce is conflict over money. Wanting more, more, more can lead to more dissatisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Those who love money will never be satisfied with money. And those who love riches will never be happy with what they have. We may be tempted to think that having more and more will make us unquestionably happy, perfectly secure, of more value as a person. None of that is true. It is true that you may buy what you think will bring you happiness in the short term, but it doesn't last. Buy a new car and you think it will make you happy. You love that new car smell. <sighs> but how long does that new car smell last? And besides that, the moment you drive it off the lot, how much does a new car depreciate in value? If you think that getting things will bring you lasting happiness, can you answer this? What were all the things you got for Christmas last year? Can you name them? If we cannot remember all the things we get for Christmas or all the things that are in our closets or basements or storage units, how can we say that they are bringing us meaningful satisfaction? Howard Hughes, who was one of the most financially successful individuals in the world, was asked, how much does it take to make a man happy? He answered, just a little more. And the result was, he was never satisfied. I have a question for you. Do you really 
want more anxiety, more exhaustion, more conflict, and more dissatisfaction in your life? What is the alternative? How is it possible to experience more contentment in life instead of more anxiety, more exhaustion, more conflict, and more dissatisfaction? The Apostle Paul wrote, I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. In the Greek, in the New Testament, the word used for recipe here literally means instructions. So, what's the recipe for? What are the instructions to experience genuine contentment in life instead of believing the falsehood that more and more money will make you automatically happy? There are some key instructions, some crucial principles that we need to learn if we're going to be contented instead of discontented. Here are some ways to experience godly contentment. Stop comparing yourself to others. The Apostle Paul is direct in confronting this in saying, are you comparing yourselves to others and becoming consumed with jealousy? Then it sounds like you are living in the flesh, no different from the rest who live by the standards of this rebellious and broken world. If we want to be people of contentment, we need to stop, stop, stop comparing ourselves to others financially and otherwise. The truth is, playing the comparison game reveals that we are emotionally insecure and spiritually immature. God has created you unique. There's no one else exactly like you in the universe. Your value, your worth is beyond compare. So playing the comparison game is foolishness in the eyes of God. It's foolish to get caught up in comparing and saying things like, I wish I had their job. I wish I had their house. I wish I had their car. I wish I could go on trips like they do. I wish I had his wife. I wish I had her husband. Why aren't our kids like theirs? That kind of comparing inevitably leads to a spirit of discontent. If we want to experience godly contentment, we need to stop comparing ourselves to others. When we compare ourselves financially to others, to others who have more possessions than we do and we start being consumed with jealousy it can lead to major financial problems if we start buying more and more stuff to try and feel good about ourselves even though we know it's going to plunge us deeper in debt it's going to result in our being anxious and frustrated to experience godly contentment you need To resist the uncontrolled desire to acquire. It can be okay to admire without having the desire to acquire. We can know contentment when we are happy for others, no matter how many possessions they have or we have. We can know contentment when we do not become jealous and envious of others who have things we don't. The truth is, we don't have to own things to enjoy them. I like sitting on the porch of a cabin by a mountain stream, listening to the water as it ripples over the rocks. That does not mean I need to go and buy a mountain cabin because that would certainly mean going into debt that is beyond my financial means. So what should I do? I should rent one when I want to use one. Well, how many of us have stuff in our garages or basements or storage units that we bought when it would have been financially wiser 
to just rent it because we use it so seldom. In our journey family, there are people who might be willing to loan you something if you need it on occasion. And you might loan to others stuff that they may need on occasion. That way, no money needs to be spent buying or renting. Instead of being envious and discontented over something someone has that you don't, how different would it be if you were to be grateful for what you do have and who you are? Now, I want to be clear. God does not say we should never desire any things. That is not Christianity. God created all that is and wants us to enjoy the good things God has made. God just doesn't want us to use money unwisely and go into deep debt because of uncontrolled desires that lead us to spend money on things we cannot afford which ends up robbing us of joy because we become so anxious and worried about money. To experience godly contentment, you need to learn to enjoy what you have. Ecclesiastes 5.18 says, Take care of yourself. Have a good time. And make the most of whatever job you have for as long as God gives you life. Way too often, we become so busy pursuing all the things that we want that we fail to enjoy what we've already got. How many people are overextended because they've bought more house than they can really afford? And then they're almost never at home because they're so busy working trying to pay for it. Please be clear on this. God wants you to enjoy life. Not to just endure it, but to enjoy it. God is not some cosmic killjoy. God created things for us to enjoy. God enjoys watching us enjoy in godly ways the things that, that God has given us. Parents understand this. They enjoy watching their kids enjoy the gifts they've given them. God generously gives to us what we need for an enjoyable, contented life. The Apostle Paul wrote, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. One thing I believe would help some of us to be more contented is to be exposed to real poverty so that we will realize how truly blessed we are. When we see people who are simply struggling to have enough food to eat in the hollers of Appalachia or the slums of major U.S. cities, or the impoverished barrios of Mexico, or the favelas of Brazil, it can help us learn to be grateful for all the stuff we do have and we often take for granted. How many of us can even begin to fathom going nine months without a shower like a friend of Rick Warren's told him he had? How many of us consider taking a shower a luxury like many people in the world do. How many of us consider ice a luxury? Those of you who travel internationally know that many places in the world do not have ice readily available. They serve soda at room temperature. I know some of you cannot imagine that. Instead of taking things you do have for granted, how about focusing on being contented with the things you do get to enjoy? I think it's so very important to remember that contentment is a choice. Whatever your circumstances, you can choose to be contented if you want to. I've had roommates from Nigeria and Brazil who grew up in families that 
most of us would consider poor. But they were two of the happiest, contented people I've ever known. They were so grateful for what they had. And they weren't constantly upset by continually wanting more, more, more. They understood that it doesn't cost anything to choose to be happy. You can choose to be happy without possessing the latest video game or going to the beach or to Disney World. For some of you to know genuine contentment, it just may be that you need to decide to change your wanter. Jesus said, watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own no matter how rich you may be. If you want and want and want things, you need to be on guard that your wanter may be getting out of control. It's morphing into greed. To know true contentment, it's vital to realize that life is not made up of the things you own. Is the focus of your life on the things you own? Here's a way to know. Look at how giving you are. Look at how generous you are. Life is meant to be about loving God and loving people. We're to invest who we are and what we possess in building loving relationships with God and with people. How we give to God and give to people reveals the level of our loving. Here's the truth when it comes to money. You've got to decide if you're going to focus your life on the acquisition of things or on your relationships with God and other people. You've got a choice to make. You've got to decide if you're going to listen to culture or to Christ. One will lead to dissatisfaction and discontent. The other will lead to godly satisfaction and contentment. The truth is, how you choose to handle money shows what you really believe about God. Jesus said, your heart will always be where your treasure is. Is God first in your life or not? How you answer that question will reveal what the purpose and meaning of your life truly is. There was a woman millionaire who took her life. She committed suicide. At the funeral, one person said, I don't understand it. She had so much to live for. Sadly, that was not true. She had so much to live on but she thought she had nothing to live for. So, what are you living for? More importantly, who are you living for? Will you embrace God and God's value system? Or the world and the world's value system? What you do with money shows which is true in your life. I hope, I pray, you will embrace the way of Christ and contentment. Would you pray with me? God, the reality is so many of us are not content. We are dissatisfied. We are restless. We are bought into the lie of the world that Gathering, accumulating possessions will bring us peace and joy, a sense of fulfillment. And some of us, God, have been pretending that we've truly known Jesus and we've bought into the lie and we just sort of pushed Jesus to the side. 
So God, right now I'm praying for anyone who does not know Jesus in a life-changing, life-transforming way. Because nothing about their lives is truly going to change for the better until they come to grips with what their relationship with Christ is like. So I'm praying, God, that they'll get really honest with themselves and with you. And some, some of them may have been just playing the religious game, acting as if they know you in an intimate way, but it's been so superficial and it's shown in selfishness and a refusal to be generous in giving. So God, I'm just praying for the convicting of the Holy Spirit that people might grapple with their relationship with you because that's the most important thing and everything else will flow from that. And I'm praying, God, hearts will change and lives will change and there will be this inner sense of calm and contentment and peace and joy that the world simply cannot give for all those who truly trust in Jesus. I pray in His name. Amen. During we talk about taking the next step. And if you would like to take the next step of making the decision to follow Jesus, we would love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, you can go to our website and fill out the e-connect card there. And we'd be happy to have a phone conversation, a Zoom conversation with you. We'll email back and forth. We'll text back and forth. Uh, we would like for you to explore what it means to follow Jesus, to know life at its very best. If you'd like to take that step of faith, we encourage you to do that. Or, or perhaps for you, uh, the step of faith would be to move from being so self-focused into be God-focused. And the way you could show that is by increasing your giving, by becoming more generous. So we want to offer you that step to follow Christ more fully, more faithfully. Uh, you can go to our website, journeyconnection.com, and you can find our Give tab right there, and you can find a multiple ways of giving. You can call our church office. You can send in your financial gifts by the mail. What's important is, do you have a heart for God? Do you want to increase in your giving? Do you want to follow Jesus more faithfully? We invite you to do that. I talked a little earlier about people who are hungry and struggling in the hollers of Appalachia. One of our mission partners is called the Bland Ministry Center. It's up in Appalachia. And they provide food for so many people. and They help with housing for so many people. They provide furniture and, and resources for people who are just living in poverty. And when you give to Journey Church, a portion of that goes to the Bland Ministry Center to help them with their ministry with people because we believe God cares and loves for all people, whatever their economic situation. And thank you for your being faithful if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus in giving so we can bless people who are in great need. One other thing. This is a difficult time in the lives of so many people in our community and in our world. If there's some way that we can encourage you, we can pray for you, we might be of assistance to you in some way. If you would go to our website and complete the eConnect card and let us know, we would be privileged to be able to try to do those things. At Journey, we want so much to be the love of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity of allowing us to do that. God bless you all.